I'm back here again with Dr. Shervin Golian and Adonis practicing in San Luis Obispo, uh, California. And we're doing a couple of cases uh, together. And uh, Shervin, you talked, the previous case, we talked about an internal resorption case that was, uh, um, that you handled very nicely using CBCT technology, uh, where you got some information about the fact that it was internal resorption and that it was not perforating. Now, this following case is one where it's the tooth has been previously treated anatomically. It looks good, right, radiographically. Right. And uh, what, what, so what is, what is the chief complaint? What is going on? Well, the chief complaint, actually, the, the patient was referred for, for this tooth here, tooth number 14, but the patient's chief complaint was sensitivity to cold and lingering pain to cold. So this is where the general dentist noticed the lesion on number 14 and couldn't really figure out why the patient was having the symptoms. Um, and actually, the, the tooth behind it, tooth number 15, is diagnosed with an irreversible pulpitis. So that's treatment plan to be root canal uh, so but, that's the source of the cold sensitivity yeah, that's because it has an intact pulp. Right, and and many times you're you're going to see root canal teeth that are asymptomatic, and they'll have these lesions. And what I'm starting to see with the the J. Marita cone beam is that uh, there's a lot of cases that actually aren't healed, or they're you know about to start failing. And because with the cone beam you don't have that issue of the the cortical plates being in your way you actually are able to diagnose cases faster than you would with uh, a conventional radiograph. I mean, this radiograph shows there's a lesion in the mesiobuccal root. Um, I believe the case was actually done by an endodontist. It looks like it was really well done, but as we take a look with the cone beam, we're gonna see that it's, in fact, it's failing. So here we are, this is the, the CBCT showing us that indeed this tooth is actually infected. Uh, we can see the lesion on the mesiobuccal root um, and when we look at these sections, what we're looking at with the yellow arrows is uh, a differential diagnosis here. Uh, you see this dark line, and the J. Morita is really special, in my opinion, because it can show you lateral canals, it can show you missed canals, and it can show you fractures. And this is a case where we have to take a look at it and, and try to imagine what this line is that we're looking at is this a additional mesial canal? Is it a fracture? Is it a lateral canal? Um, and it's definitely leading to failure, so we need to investigate this further. And this is something where you can actually show a patient in three dimensions, whereas on an x-ray, it's not really possible to show them what you're seeing and what could be deficient in this root canal therapy. So. Yeah, I mean, anytime I see an isolated lesion around, especially the mesiobuccal root of a maxillary molar, where endo appears adequate, but um, there is a lesion associated with that root, you're right, the differential diagnosis is either a missed MB2 or a crack or a fracture. Uh, CBCT here comes handy in terms of showing us, at least on that uh, axial section, a little bit of an area, radiolucency. But you're right, there is also a line. Uh, but the question is, is that line basically just a diffraction from, uh, uh, you know, from, from, from the, uh, uh, the x-ray angle, or is it uh, an actual crack? Uh, what would you, so this is a case of treatment planning. You haven't yet treated this tooth yet. So right. what, do you, what are your inclinations? What, which way would you be um, leaning uh, towards, and what do you think would be the best uh, practices in a case like this? You know, this case, it, it really highlights the importance of perioprobing. You know, it, for me, every case, we need to check the foundation of the tooth first. And we perioprobe every case that we treat, whether it's a pulp exposure or it's a, a little bit more complicated of a case like this. Um, in this case, there was a 10 millimeter perioprobing along the mesial aspect of the tooth, um, which leans us a little bit closer towards diagnosing it as a vertical root fracture. However, as, as you stated to me, it's, it is possible that it's just the drainage the aspect. sulcular uh, sinus tracts, yeah. right. They're not that common, but they can sometimes happen depending yeah. on the path of least resistance in some cases. So yeah. that kind of brings us back to square one. So what do we do? Uh, what do we do? You know, I think it, in this case, you really need to get the patient involved because the patient has to under, understand the, your, your diagnosis, your differential diagnosis, and also the prognosis for the case. You know, it, it's a case where it, it does have a guarded prognosis because of the periodontal probing. Um, my inclination is to attempt to retreat these cases before we get inside and jump into surgery. 
Um, so I, I would try to guide the patient towards retreating it to see actually what we can find inside the tooth. Yeah. And if we can find that canal, then I think we could treat it successfully. If not, the other option is apicoectomy or extraction of the tooth. Right. So. I think an exploratory component to this would not be a bad idea to directly visualize. I think either retreatment through a conservative axis opening through the crown over the mesobuccal root or surgically an exploratory surgery will certainly let us give us that information that we need whether there is a crack or not. Uh, I think it has to do with you know, the comfort zone as to which way you prefer. Um, but I think that maybe going in there, removing the root canal filling and the mesial buckle, searching for the MB2, and if you find the placing calcium hydroxide, and then just seeing the patient back in a month just to see how things go, may not be a, a bad idea this way. The patient's um, investment might be limited too in terms of just, you know, doing an exploratory procedure, finding out how things go. But I think these are really important cases, and they kind of, they, these specifically depict how a CBCT, and especially that axial section, can come handy in terms of treatment planning a case for what. But this particular one, you know, it's still a little bit up in the air as to which way we should go. Right. But more information is clearly better. I, I, I think probably retreating this may not be a bad idea, or apicoectomy uh, for with an exploratory surgery. So let's take this idea of a, a missed MB2 here and go into the next case where this patient saw you for? Well, it, it was a, a similar situation where uh, this, this patient was not symptomatic. The general dentist noted this lesion on the radiograph. Um, and I mean, this root canal was not treated by an endodontist. So uh, they were worried that it's failing uh, the patient wasn't really concerned about it because they weren't really feeling anything. Asymptomatic, yeah. But we can see just from the PA that there's a mesial buccal lesion in this tooth. And there's again, we showing. take another angle uh, just to, to see if we can separate any root. Sometimes an MB2 will show up on that. Um, again, this is the conventional protocol of how to look at this with PAs. but. We speak to the patient, let them know of this new technology that we have with the 3D cone beam to help us with the diagnosis and treatment planning. So here we are, this is the actual J. Marita uh, imaging that we see. And in this case, this is very clear. And in fact, the patient was a lot more motivated to treat this tooth once we were able to see this in three dimensions. Because again, the cortical plates don't get in the way of showing the lesion and you can actually show the patient uh, how large the lesion is in the mesial buccal root, where the infection is located, and actually how much damage it's doing to the bone. It's even riding along the floor of the sinus, so it's uh, pretty close to perforating it. And in fact, it, it may even be perforating in uh, one of the, the shots there. Um, and the yellow arrows, what they're pointing to, is an actual missed MB2 canal. We can see it in the axial section. We can, we can see it... Um, from a top-down view, there's definitely room in that root for another root to exist. So we explained to that patient that this needs to be retreated. Absolutely. I think that coronal view on the lower left side, when you see that broad type of a lesion and you see the canal being <clears throat> completely shifted to one side, there's a very high likelihood that there is an additional canal. And also on the axial section on the upper right, when you see that little lip of, a, uh, of the root, a little bit of a projection towards the lingual, uh, depicting a ribbon-shaped type of a root, um, you know, a key-shaped type of a configuration. There's, again, if not a whole MB2, there's definitely an isthmus there, and that, that certainly can explain this kind of a lesion. So right. what did you do? So in this case, we actually clinically examined the tooth and found that there, were, there was caries around the margins of the crown. So we removed the crown. Um, there was a post inside this tooth that uh, looked like it belonged to medieval century. It was very large, and uh, there it is right there. So, you know, what I wanted to do is deal with where the infection was first. That's one of the rules with endo is we want to maximize the contact time of our sodium hypochlorite with the infection. So I wasn't very worried about the palatal, so we left that towards the end of treatment. So I removed the gutta percha. Um, again, we were getting poor apex locator readings just because of the, the con configuration and shape of the uh, canal. So what we did is take a radiograph and, 
and saw that we removed all the gutta percha, we're into the lesion, now we can get our working length determination in this case. Yeah. So Again, another reason why a radiograph is handy, even though you have an apex locator, because in some cases where there's resorption due to the infection, the apex may not be close enough to get an accurate enough of a reading. And I think I agree with you. I mean, there's no point in removing the post right off the bat, spend all that time and energy if you don't end up finding the MB2, given the fact that the lesion was primarily associated with the mesobuccal root, you did the right thing of focusing primarily on finding that which was causing the infection and then proceeded to remove uh, the, the, the post. And then I can see here that you have a working shot here with the cones and the uh, some sealer. Yeah, and you know, with, with the working shot of, in this case, what we needed to really focus on was actually getting the working lengths of those two roots. And again, the CBCT comes in handy because when we go back to the original CBCT, we can see that the mesiobuccal root was a couple millimeters longer than the actual MB2 canal. So in this case, we're fitting our cones to those lengths um, and we uh, have our sealer in place. And I actually sealed off the distal buccal and the mesiobuccal roots and then concentrated on the palatal, on the palatal. here. So the post is out, uh, cleaned out the root, filled in, sealed it. And this is the bioceramic sealer with the bioceramic cones. Make a beautiful post base in there, put in a nice conventional parallel post in mm -hmm. this tooth, do a composite buildup. It's prepped, ready to go for the general dentist to actually take an impression. So, Terrific. And uh, here it was obviously difficult to get the MB2 on the, on the same shot because of the same reason that the original x-ray, you couldn't separate it. But there is an MB2 that's filled here as well. Right. So, uh, you got four canals filled, and there's a beautiful post uh, that's placed in there. I can understand the reason for post because you're missing basically a good half of the structure on the distal end of this tooth. Um, but otherwise speaking, do you generally uh, use posts and molars, or do you more on the side of not using posts? You know, we uh, I've done both, and really a, a lot of it is the preference of how the general dentist wants to restore it. We always work as a team with the our general dentists and other specialists that we work with. So mm -hmm. there are general dentists that would prefer a post in a tooth and if I feel that it doesn't need it, if I see something in there, I'll let them know and we'll just go with a composite buildup. But I haven't, it, a post that's placed passively, I really haven't seen any issues with it. If it's especially placed under the microscope or right in the center of the tooth, we're sealing the entire yeah. system right away. Yeah, there really isn't any issues with leakage, fracturing, anything like that, so. Yeah, I think I agree. I think satisfaction if you bond your posts, and then if you have the proper occlusion, you're not relying on your post to bear the brunt of all the occlusal forces and the retention, then it wouldn't have a deleterious effect. And the fact that you as the endodontist are placing the posts here helps reduce any potential odds of procedural accidents, such as perforations that occur when people are trying to prepare a post after uh, you know, obturation's been done where they don't have a sense of direction of the coronal half of the root. So in that right. sense, I do agree with you that, you know, it, it may not have as much of a negative impact and uh, could help retain the, uh, the core a little bit more. All right, well, why don't we come back and talk about the last case, uh, you know, right after this. <laughs>